Hello, everyone. My name is Jill Provo, and I'm the director of NSCC's new Center for the Advancement of Educational Equity and Belonging, which is dedicated to ensuring equity in student success. And so behalf, on behalf of Nova Scotia Community College, I wish you a very warm welcome to our session entitled Ask a Black Entrepreneur. But first, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we are in Mi'kmaq, the unceded territory and ancestral homeland of the Mi'kmaq Nation. Our relationship is based on a series of peace and friendship treaties between the Mi'kmaq Nation and the Crown dating back to 1725. In Nova Scotia, we recognize that we are all treaty people. I also want to personally state the significance of this acknowledgement from my perspective as a biracial woman with lineage to the Black Nova Scotian community. I also come from a displaced people and I feel compelled to show my profound respect to the Indigenous and Black communities. Although there are differences, there is a deep interconnectedness between the Mi'kmaq people and the historic Black Nova Scotian community. We share much pain from a past inflicted with racism and violence against our people. For that reason, I do a land acknowledgement and recognition of the harms of the past and equally as important to recognize the impact this history continues to have on us today. Divisions within and between our communities only further supports colonialism. In my opinion, the separation means, means we lose access and we lose power and we lose voice. And so I ask all of you here today to not only go back and read again and reflect on the calls to action from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, but to do something in solidarity, to take action. We need to ask ourselves what it means to unite and become true allies, and it most certainly requires us all to do our part to break down barriers, even when that work is hard and hostile, to ensure we stand together in pursuit of systemic change. We are all treaty people. So, as we move through this session, I would like us to remain cognizant of being an unceded, colonized territory which has left Indigenous people, as well as other people of color and marginalized groups, disproportionately impacted by racism, discrimination, and related trauma. Let's keep this in mind as we work together to disrupt barriers and striving for more equitable Nova Scotia. And please, let's never forget that we are better together than we are apart. And so I want to thank you. And before I begin our panel, I want to say to you all, please know NSCC is serious about our work in fighting racism and striving for equity. This is the first of many webinars we plan to host that will be open to the public. And so please know we will demonstrate our commitment and our accountability to do our part to ensuring students have the opportunity to excel at NSCC. The theme for African Heritage Month 2021 is Black History Matters. Listen, learn, share, and act. So please think about those words. We want you to listen, learn, share, and act. Actively reflect on what you can do to fight anti-Black racism. We have our, asked our panelists to be frank about their experiences as entrepreneurs. And so after you hear about the barriers, challenges, and opportunities facing them, we need you to go out of your way to support Black business owners as one of example of something you can do. Because you see intentionally supporting black excellence, which all of our panelists today represent, that is the responsibility of us all. That is a key message we want you to take away. We are all accountable. This is everyone's work. This is everyone's business. Please make it yours. So now let's get started. This panel is being offered in partnership again with the Center for the Advancement of Educational Equity and Belonging, our Picto Campus, NSCC Entrepreneurship, Human Rights and Equity Services, and Applied Research and Innovation at NSCC. So remember, Black History Matters. Listen, learn, share, and act. So on that note, I'm going to hand the floor over to our host, Tyree Haley, who is the one who actually made this event happen today, to introduce you to our guests, Salitha, Trevor, and Barbara. Thank you. Tyree? Jill, thank you so much for the wonderful introduction and the land acknowledgement. Jill is actually, as she said, the director of our brand new Center for Advancement, Education, Equity and Belonging, which is very exciting and definitely something to look into as big things are coming uh, in the future. So good afternoon, everybody, and thank you so much for attending this very special event we have for you today. My name is Tyree Haley. I'm the Student Service Advisor, African Cultural Support. And I'm based out of the Pictou campus. Um, at NSCC, celebrating Afri African Heritage Month is at the top of our priority, and this year is no exception. We want to bring something very special and new as we introduce you Ask a Black Entrepreneur Series. 
We wanted to showcase some of our very own entrepreneurs doing great things in the community and want to give them a platform to discuss the processes and the necessary steps to turn your passion into a business. I will be interviewing three panelists with a series of engaging questions directed to their personal journeys and advice that they can pass along to you. You are more than welcome to submit questions to be added at the very end of our, our discussion here today. Uh, we're asking that you could either send the, the questions in the chat log or you can email it to e2 at nscc.ca and of course we'll answer those questions at the end. Last before uh, last thing, we will be posting a survey in the chat today. We highly encourage you to fill it uh, after the session for a chance to win a special prize package from one of our three entrepreneurs. We will be also giving out African Heritage Month theme prizes so make sure you fill out the survey and always welcome to fill out the survey. Now, before we begin, I want to give each entrepreneur a moment to discuss a little bit about themselves before we get into the questions. So I'm going to ask each entrepreneur individually if they could tell us a little bit about themselves, their upbringing, their background, and you know how they got along with their entrepreneurial journal journey. So I'll first start with you, Trev, if you could introduce yourself to everybody and just give us a little idea of uh, how you got to where you're at. Hello everyone, I'm Trevor Silver. Nice to meet you. Thank you for um, having me here. Uh, so I'm from North Preston, Nova Scotia. Uh, my initial dream was to become a lawyer, so I pursued that. Um, once I got to law school, I realized it wasn't for me, but I had an idea for this fashion brand, uh, Trev Clothing. So the, the initial design that I had was balanced success. So it was the justice scale. So one side had a heart, one side had money and uh, work money career, family love friendship, you have to balance to succeed. So I had that idea. And then from there, I took it and I started the Trev brand using the principles for success, trust, respect, education, and value, where you have to trust yourself, respect yourself, educate yourself, value yourself and others to succeed. So a lot of the brand has to do with principles for success. And if it wasn't for me pursuing my initial dream of being a lawyer, I wouldn't have stumbled upon this new dream. And I feel like I'll be able to my goal was to be financially free and be able to help my community. And I feel like with this brand, I'll be able to do much more than if I was if I was to become a lawyer. And and I feel like I'm doing what like my purpose is. So I feel like wait, what I got to do or what, what we should all do is pursue our purpose and allow it to uh, create our dreams. Thank you. Thank you for that, Trev. Uh, moving on to Salita. Could you give us a little bit of your background? No, not So guys, I am originally from the Caribbean island of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. I moved to Nova Scotia to finish my university education at Mount St. Vincent and felt like home here, so I stayed. Um, and then I found from my passion of modeling, I realized I can turn that into a business and I started coaching, which then developed into expanding my business from just coaching to uh, agency where I'm now with a team of amazing Nova Scotians are managing talents from the area and also with that production. So we are involved in producing runway shows as well as my purpose in life, which I feel is drives me right back to education. So the Atlantic Scholarship Organization, I started with my sister in 2020. Um, so yeah, it's been a journey of just exploring and expanding as the opportunities came uh, my way and just jumping on board with them. So. Yeah, <laughs> that's me in a nutshell. Thank you so much, Salita. Uh, moving along, last but not least, Barbara Roberts. Hi everyone. Um, so my family's originally from uh, Digby in Lincolnville, Nova Scotia, but I've lived um, in Ontario as well. So I actually have two businesses. One is Afro Nova Jewelry and Accessories, and then the other one is called Roberts Wellness Services. So I'm a trained social worker. I have a master's from York, and um, that was one of my first passions was to help, help others help themselves and to be the person that I thought I needed when I was growing up. So um, I had this a Roberts Wellness Service open for a few years, but actually the combination of the pandemic and the Black Lives Matter movement really built 
up the demand for the services and people being more willing, willing, willing to do more things like this online. People were willing to um, uh, listen and learn and do things online. So that really helped me build my business because I could do it from home. So I think that's the thing about COVID. We've all had to change things we've done. Um, with that said, um, Robert's Wellness Service was really because I wanted a mask. I wanted an African fabric mask and I couldn't find one in my area. So uh, I looked around and I found someone that could make me a mask. I already had the fabric and then it really just tumbled from there. I was just so excited to see all the different products out there and where I could get them from and where I could go find them. And um, I also realized that when I went to the market, there wasn't people that looked like me. There wasn't products I was looking for. So how can I make that happen? And I realized I could make that happen. I didn't have to wait for someone else. So once I realized that and once I had the support of my family, I started to bring my you know, African centric products to the markets. So I'm just really excited to be here today. Thank you so much, Barbara, and thank you to Salitha also and Trev for your introduction. Um, I must say I know these three panelists pretty well and they're exceptional human beings and uh, very great trailblazers for the future that we have. So I'll start to go into the questions. So I will ask each entrepreneur um, one question at a time and that question will be directed to them. Um, so starting off, I will start with Trev. So this is for you, my brother. What made you want to pursue your business and how did you take the necessary steps to transform your ideas into a reality? Uh, so for me, it was kind of like I was at like this midlife crisis point to where like I put so much work in to becoming a lawyer and like I'm here and I'm like, I know this is not what I want to do. So I was like, like, what am I going to do? So I had the idea of the brand. I always been like in the fashion. I always like feel like I was in tune with like like fashion and what I liked and stuff like that. So and I kind of feel like I knew what people like. So I figured like, hey, let me let me try to do this to the fashion thing. So when I when I was in my going into my second year, I got a few samples and I just like I took my student loan, like some of my student loan that I had and I invested it into samples and then people in the community, my friend, my family, they all were like, yeah, we like this. We like this. And then um, from there, I was like, OK, maybe I'm on to something. So I kept kept at it, kept at it. And then from the first initial design, I, I spun it off to new designs. I kept learning. I kept trying to figure out what I got to do uh, in order to like continue to build it. And it's it's not as easy as it sounds like people think like, oh, you could just print a shirt. Like sometimes you can like one one in a million chance where you print a shirt and you can build like grow, grow a big, huge business quick. But like for me, what I realized that it, it takes a lot of work and dedication and and I and a lot of learning like I learned so much about like fashion a lot of about like modeling about, a lot about photography a lot about like building websites so I, I built my own website I did a few like I learned a lot of stuff on my own but I also like reached out and learned from other people like hired other people um utilized my relationships like uh uh yeah leveraged my relationships and then from there so one uh in retrospect like I was kind of thinking like well Law school is a for sure thing. Like I know I could do it. I know I could be be a lawyer. I know like one. I didn't know I could do it until I actually got there. But like once I got there, I, like I know I could do this, and I know I don't want to do this. So now what am I gonna do? And then I transitioned into the fashion world, and it it kept it like it's it's the work that I put in, but it's also it, it started to work. So I was like, wow, like this this could be for me. And then eventually it it started to prosper and grow. And like um, what would I say that um yeah I'm, I'm i'm really happy in retrospect like i, I used to think like I, I would regret like dropping out of law school but it's like one of the best decisions i made and it kind of if i didn't go through that journey of education i wouldn't have got here so if i didn't want to become a lawyer i wouldn't even have went to university so it's kind of like i'm i'm blessed and now i can i can tell my friends and my family and my siblings my kids in the future like education is important because you never know where it could take you and I'm hoping and I feel like I know that it's going to take me places with just just from the educational aspect, because if I like if I didn't know all the stuff I knew that I learned from school or the people that I met in school, I wouldn't have got to where I am with with my business in general to where I am. So 
it's uh, education is really the power and it, and, it, and it drives you. I really like how you said that. And I'm a strong believer that, um, you know, all your life experiences added up will prepare you for what the future has in store for you. So I'm more than happy to hear that, you know, it's working out for you. I've seen your business grow in the last two years exponentially. So uh, kudos to you, my brother. So the real, on, and like, see, I knew you from the community, but now I know you as uh, many, you wear many different hats, but one, one main thing, you're, you're, you're an exceptional model. And and you, you I appreciate, appreciate that a lot, and that that's been helping both of us. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. All love. So um, I'll move on to the next question. Thank you, Trevor, for answering that. Um, so my next question is directed to Salita. Um, so my question for you, my sister, is: What are some challenges that you face being a black entrepreneur, and what kind of things do you do to overcome these challenges? Um, it's such a loaded question because it's. There's so much, um, and it, in terms of the obstacles that are placed in front of you, you you're talented. You have the skill sets um, and this burning passion inside of you to you know get your business out there and go. Uh, but when you're faced to face with the person who is sort of holding that door, whether they open it or not, the gatekeeper, they just see a black woman, and for me that really has taken me on mental downfalls as well as just, you know, am I doing something that is going to benefit anybody in the long run? Um, so to look at the struggles, it's it's constant. The minute I got into this, uh, first as a model, um, I was the token. Then I got into it coaching. I was good enough to coach the models, but not as my own business. So when I transferred it into becoming my own businesswoman, um, I got that pushback where everybody wanted it to be free, you know, so it was my talent was good enough to get you where you need to go, but it wasn't good enough for me to survive on. Um, and that kind of really messed with me. Like, am I really doing something that is worthy? Uh, so those challenges where you're seen for your talent as good enough to come in, but only if I have a non-black person ahead of me that I'm working for. So how dare me or how, why do I think I have that audacity to come in as the owner off with my shoulders back and my chin up um, and walk in the room as the, the person that you're going to give your money to? And I found it really hard getting over that mentally for me personally, but on the outside, I had to keep pushing and chugging on as if everything was, was well and just, you know, shoving it off my shoulder. So I think really overcoming people seeing me as lesser than but capable only if I was attached to something other than black. So my talent and my skills were seen valuable, um, if that, that makes any sense. And to overcome it now, I just now look at the people that I'm working with and for, and knowing that I have to keep pushing on because they're depending on me to break these barriers down because um, other people opened up the door a little for me and now I have to open it a little bit more so the next person coming can, you know, Chug to, especially in the fashion industry um, where I'm at, that it's it's really tight knit and I'm seen still as an outsider. So just getting over that mental block, it's knowing that I'm accepted for what I'm worth, really. Yeah. And before I go, I want to thank you for doing this. You're an amazing young man and we're just looking forward to seeing where you take this journey. So thank you for putting this together. I appreciate that, Salita. I appreciate that. And I love how you say, you know, you, you, you have to go through some adversity. You know, it, you carry yourself very well. You know, I know you personally and you carry yourself very professional. So it's not fair that, you know, people will automatically look at you. And I remember you shared a story with me, uh, you know, the other day you went to go meet with some people and, you know, you, you have a lovely Cindy who's your manager and they, they would speak to her and, and kind of bypass you. So, um, you know, these are really important things that we have to look at to change the narrative so that we can really put ourselves in a, in a better position. So I really appreciate that answer and the feedback and the, the wonderful things. I'm trying to be politically correct in a sense, or, or trying to keep it, um, I guess that what we fall into as black people, we are always thinking of how we're going to offend somebody so we're being tactful. Because like you said, you know, I was looking for space and we, I have our COO, Cindy, who is white, and they would speak to her instead of me and I'm standing there and even her, she's offended by that but they would rather speak to their white person in the room and dismiss me. Um, and it, 
that plays on your head, but I just know that I have to keep chugging on because if I don't stand there and luckily the white person standing next to me is just as aggressive and um, sort of passionate about making a change. So she used her voice in that moment to say, no, you direct your question to her. She's the owner. Um, so we need more of that, especially in our businesses where people are willing to stand up and step outside of the, their comfort zone. So thank you, Cindy, um, for always, you know, using your voice for, for others. So. That's working. That's working. Thank you for that, Salita, that little bit extra there. Um, so I'm going to move on to the next question, and this is for Barbara. Um, so in your in your opinion, uh, what are some important skills that you must possess in order to become a successful entrepreneur? So that's for you, my sister, Barbara. OK, well, thank you. Um, don't think it's any one skill or even a combination. I think it's the person. Um, I think there's a type of person that can be an entrepreneur. Um, I can say I'm not sure if I'm that person. It really was a mix of hit and misses and kind of knowing the services I'd like to see out there. Um, I know lifelong learning and I think Trev talked to and a few others about I love everything my education has led me to. I've worked really hard to get here, but they're, they're included a lot of tears. Um, so I know it's a rough journey, but I recognize that it did bring me here. Um, that's one of the reasons I love working for NSCC. It has blessed me to see students dream take hold and take flight. And I'm proud to be part of that process. So we all need to learn. And as an entrepreneur, the thing is you're going to get one thing done and then you have to learn another thing. So it doesn't stop. And I think that's one thing you have to remember. It's that it is a hustle. It is a, a track. It's a, it's a race that you're always running. You're winning, but you're running. So I think that's what I've learned, especially is that I always have to change and grow and learn. So you have to be ready for that. You can't be just okay with one product if you want to continue for the long haul. Um, organization, I think, is the big key because you still have your life, you still have your family, and you still have maybe your main job like me. So how do you make it all work? And organization is key time management. Um, someone gave me some really great advice once when I was going to open my private practice was, Take one to two hours out of your day and only focus on your business. If you can do that, then when your day gets busy, you'll still have that one to two hours you've always kept in out. So I'd say that first. If you have any type of goal, no matter what it is, you don't have to stop what you're doing in your tracks. Take one to two hours out of your day and focus on that. And then when it comes for you to shine and move forward, you're going to know how to keep that time out for your business and yourself. Mentorship is so important. I think it's actually the cornerstone to good black business and a small business. Um, I know that I've had mentors to help me, including Tinio Rock and um, one of our black community members, Bernadette Hamilton Reed and uh, Nina Barnaby as well. Others to support my journey. Um, you really need to hear from people that have been there and done that. Um, you need to know what's out there and mentorship gives you that ability to see firsthand to even to get your toe wet to support and maybe work for someone else if you're not quite ready to do your own thing. Um, you need your family support. You need to tell them your dreams and be honest about how much time this is going to take away from you um, and the other things that you're doing. So you really need to be honest with that. So mentorship is really important. Networking is also key. You have to put yourself out there. And one thing I've always learned is always keep business cards on you. You never know when the opportunity to network is going to happen. And network outside of what you normally think would be people or places you need to be connected to. What other parts of the community can you connect your business and your product to? Um, and know your books, understand your budget. It might not be your strength. It's not mine. Thank goodness for my husband, Andre Roberts. But I can tell you, you need to know what's coming in and out of your budget and where your products come from. I really see the love of these other entrepreneurship entrepreneurs in their products. And that's what I love about mine, too. I'm my number one buyer. So I'd say those are really good things to start with. Perfect, Barbara. I really like those answers. I especially like the idea of being a student and, and being willing to learn new stuff and learn from people. I think that that's very important because you can never learn too much stuff. So I really appreciate that answer, Barbara. Thank you for that. So I'm moving right along. 
This is a really good question um, for students. Uh, this one's directed uh, to my brother Trevor. Um, what advice would you give a full time student who's looking to start a side hustle, but maybe not having the necessary time they'd like to work on it? Uh, thank you. Great question. And I'll piggyback off what Barbara was saying about to take an hour a day. So like when when I was in school, um, I found myself often like when I even when I was in law school, it's just like in class drawing like designs, creating designs. So during not not I'm not saying use the time that you have to work on that you're supposed to utilize for school, but take the free time like instead of playing games or like hanging out with friends, like make sure and take some time to work on your business. Like if if uh, like Barbara was saying, if you have an hour a day or two hours a day by the end of the year, like one everyone ha can find an hour a day, like just stay up an extra hour or something and you get that's that's 365 hours that you worked in on your business and that calm that compound interest comes back when you say, OK, well, like five, like say you say you're working, going to school and then you're working one hour a day on your business uh, for five years times that by 365 hours. How many hours did you put in your business? And for me, like there's nights when I'm up till 5, 6 a.m. working on stuff and it's, and it's the work that people don't see going in. And then another thing is like the mentors and the people that are your peers. Like uh, I have fr friends from my community, like shout out to Nivelle and Cor Corvell Smooth Meal Prep and R&B Kitchen. They, they work really hard and seeing them work, like even seeing Nivelle work, go to school and build his business makes me like I have no excuse. Like if, if if I know someone else in my same position can do it, I can do it too. You know what I mean? And that's kind of one of the things that I always lean on is as I try to find the inspiration from others and see what if if I mean if if, if someone else can do it, like I know I can do it. And that's that's kind of the, the the attitude I embody, and that's where I kind of derive my motivation. I'm not saying like burn yourself out, like try to find time to to relax and 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 chill, but like. It's also like no one else is going to build your dream for you. Like it's, it's on you at the end of the day. Like and when it comes to like either creating Trev clothing or solely productions or or anything is it takes effort. Like if if we would have did our first year and we, like like my first year was 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 not that good. So like I don't know how anyone else is, but if, if we would have gave up that first year and then it's, if we say, oh, it's not working. It's not going where we wanted to go. Like even right now, like I'm like even though I'm like almost going into five years in, like I'm still at my first year goal, the, the first or second year goals that I had. So it's like aim super high. And, and like if you don't reach them, just keep going and keep going. And like as long as you see a steady, like for me, as long as I see a steady incline, I'll continue to pursue my dream. Like if 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 I like with the law school thing, if I feel like it's not for me and I know 100 percent I'm not going to look back and have regrets, then I'm changing the lane. But but right now I'm at a place where back against the wall, I'm going to make it work. Like, like 50 cents that get rich or die trying. Not saying I'm in it for the money, but I want to provide people with value. And as long as I can continue to provide value, then I feel like I'm going to get value back. So inspirational, my brother. You said it perfectly. Um, I love the fact that you say, you know, I feel like a lot of people fall in the, the habit of not having an abundance type of mentality. And, you know, I feel like, you know, when you when you support your brothers and sisters or whoever for that matter, you know, I feel like it will always come back full 10. You know what I mean? So I, I feel you 100 percent when you say, you know, you see your your brother like Nabel and, and he he uh, works out too. Like he, he works out early in the mornings, like yeah. he has so much on the go. So, you know, I'm a strong believer that, you know, when I see you guys hustling or, you know, it, it motivates me to want to do more because I see all this great stuff that you're doing. So. I really appreciate that answer, Trev. That that's wonderful. Um, so I got the next question is for my sister Salita. So if you could name a few things that you learned in school or education that you were able to take away and apply to the real life world in your business. Yeah, and I I kept thinking of like when you asked me to be on the panel, like things that I wanted to share that I think people can benefit from, and I'm glad you posed that question because. In university, when I moved here, um, I got thrown into a different way of, of um, doing things in terms of school and everything like that. And especially in, in the courses where you're dealing with a lot of like the marketing end of things, because that's that was my focus. We got thrown into groups and I came here and I was all about get the education, head down, chug away at the books and do it. And I, I, I came from an individual place. 
um, in terms of that's where my journey is going to take me and I can do it myself. But being put into groups and you had to work with people from all over the world and also with their work ethic. So some people are going to be really hard at it. Some people are just going to sit back and let you do all the work. So I figured from you know that experience when I thought that doing that was just a waste of my time and my grade was suffering or my grade would increase because of it. Um, I wasn't in control of it all. Now that I see that I'm outside of university with my own businesses, that I needed that. I needed that group setting. So for those of you that are still in university or um, college and you're put into settings where you have to work with a group, know that it's be you're being prepared for what's going to happen outside so when you work whether you own your own business or you're working for someone else you have to learn how to sometimes lead and even if you're in the leadership role you have to learn that your team members all have such important parts to add to the success of what project or business that you're working on so i think that's the biggest takeaway other than the you know the, the theory everything that i was taught but working with people, the networking, if I go back to what Robert said, and finding people that you didn't think would be in your network. So expanding that network and um, socializing in the sense that, you know, it, it's not just an individual journey. You need the people along the way to get you to the success. Um, and if I bring it back to Trevor, like even though we're in different industry in terms of his business as, you know, fashion designer, uh, owning his own brand, my other business, Atlantic Scholarship Organization, Trev reached back, even though he's not there where he wants to be in terms of, you know, hitting that sort of, um, how should I put it? He's not where he, he, he sees his brand taking him at the sort of not end, but that's success where he can sit back and just live on it. While he's working hard and struggling to get his business out there, he's reaching back to organizations like mine and offering support. So dipping into the, the, the profits he's making and giving back to students through the Atlantic Scholarship Organization and other people. So I think it's important that we highlight things like that, that it's all, you don't have to wait until you've made it to give back or to support others and pull them on their way up. So I really commend Trevor and Drek Floating for what he's doing in the community. Um, so my biggest takeaway would be, networking networking is really key because the, the important thing is who you know and who's going to open that door and the people you thought may not have been a sort of relevant in your process are some of the most important people you might meet down the road to tie it back in so the group the group the grouping in those sessions are, are worthwhile paying attention to and you never know who's sitting next to you you might be sitting next to in sort of different businesses but needing each other to build your business um, individually. Beautifully said, Soika. I think it's really important to step out of your comfort zone and, and you really have to start demonstrating some of these core attributes now where you're in school so that you know you can apply them to the real world when you graduate. So I, I really like that answer. That's, that's phenomenal. So the next question is for my sister Barbara. Um, why is it important to give back to the community and what are some ways that you can give back um, to the community or some ways that you've personally given back to the community? Well, I think the question kind of started to be answered. You know, you need to give back early and often. And I think that it really brings back a term called Sankofa. And uh, so Sankofa is, is a term from Ghana in West Africa, and it means you have to go back. You have to look back and move forward. And that's what I love about it. You don't have to get stuck there. You want to look, reclaim, and move forward. So Sankofa really is, for me, part of my business, and it's part of giving back, and it's at all stages. So I always knew that that was going to be part of the um, piece of Afro Nova, and of course, my wellness practice. I wanted to make sure I was giving back at every point, um, because I only am here because of the support I have. This wasn't like magically delicious, and all of a sudden, I got to be a business person. Um, I took the time to get to know people and people took the time and the um, space for me because people are busy. So I appreciate that. So <clears throat> some of the events that I've given back is uh, when I'm offered to speak on my products or wellness, I go and I speak. And sometimes there's a speaker's fee and I think it's important to understand you know your worth. 
but a lot of the times I don't mind going in and supporting and passing on my knowledge because it's a gift and I'm glad that I have it to give. Um, but I've done things with the support of my family, delivering groceries, giving meals to people in need. Um, I found some Black Panther book bags at Walmart and I was so excited. And of course, you know, the discount, I bought a whole bunch. I put some gift cards in there and I donated them to my son's school in his name. And uh, unfortunately, of course, Black Panther passed away just a few days before after that. And everyone thought it was in memory of him, but really it was just something, a special gift. And I know uh, Black Panther, that movie kind of um, invigorated us all, right? It made us want to learn a little bit more about our community and where we're from. I think that was one of the pieces that I got from that. But um, I do school events. Um, we were really excited. My husband works for the elementary school here and we did Black and Indigenous Lives Matter decals for all of the staff that identified for us and I was just really proud to know that I could give this product to someone that they were excited about it and it makes me want to make sure that I can offer it to more people um so just giving back those things I also feel that I need mentorship and clinical supervision but I also give it back when I'm when I'm approached so I think you're never too old or grown to need that support one thing but I also feel like it's important to give it when you feel ready and I know that I feel ready to do that, and I'm happy that some people have reached out and I've been able to give back my time. Thanks. Perfect, perfect. And and you actually shared uh, the backpack story with uh, Chad Badwick uh, with me uh, personally, and I thought that that was really cool. Uh, you know, the timing did, you know, line up perfectly for that. So, I mean, that's really special. So, you know, we're lucky to have you, Barbara. Um, my next question goes to my brother, Trevor. Um, funding can come in many ways you know your personal network funding organizations etc when you started out how can you access funds for your business where what kind of places did you look at first so first off i just used kind of what i had access to so uh, my student loans um and then like friends so like when because so when i first invested my student loans i'm like Boom, I take these student loans, I'll be able to put it in, I'll get it back, I'll be able to have that money to like to, to pay back or whatever. And it didn't work like that, like the money was just gone. And it's like, oh, I need more money because I need to get more shirts or I need to pay my rent. And then it's like, okay, part-time job. Okay, part-time job's not cutting it um, because I'm still a full-time student at the time. So my student loans don't go in repayment. And then I loan a couple of dollars for my brother and then, you know, spend to get it back, pay him back. And it's also like, I'm building like um, I'm building credit with my community, basically, like I'm building credit with my friends. So like they know they can trust me to get it back. And then like I went to the banks, I went to a few organizations and it's like you got too much student loans. Um, you got too much debt. We can't do anything for you. So it's just like, OK, back to the streets, back to my friends. And then my friends would like help me do it again. And then it's like one of the things that like the rejection helped me with is like, OK, it's, it's not working how it's supposed to be working right now financially, but I'm going to show you that like, hey, I don't need you. And it's kind of like not like a, a bad thing because I, I use use it as good energy and I take it. And every single time and, th and this happened probably both over the past four years, I've always been like in a place where like I need to come back from. And every single time like I end up like leveling up again and leveling up again. And, and I find it's when your back's against the wall, when you have no other choice but to figure it away you find creative ways to make make things work and that's what I've been continuing to continuously been able to do so it's like um you just got to be creative ask like ask yourself like kind of it's similar to to the to giving it's like if you, if you don't if you're not conscious of it or you don't ask yourself okay where can I give what can I do creatively to give then the like the opportunity is not really going to come up but if you ask yourself okay like where can I get funding who's going to help me who can help me and then it's like you plug into those places and like sometimes you'll get dead end sometimes you'll you'll find opportunities and and it's like it's not a bad thing to be like to call your friend or to call somebody and be like hey I need this if, if, if they can do it for you but it's not not in the sense of like I'm trying to use you it's like I need you I got you when I get on or I got you when I get back and if if I hey, if I don't get back and, and say say my business doesn't work out I'll find a way to pay you back and I find that's the thing of like building credit within your community like facial credit and having people can trust you like like for example like if you know someone like if you loan them a hundred dollars they, ne they never ever paid you back 
then you're not going to loan them $100 again. And the banks kind of treat us the same way. But it's also when it comes to like building a business, sometimes your friends and the people around you may not see your vision until it's like until you actually make it a real life. And then it's like, well, I asked you and you didn't help me. I'm not going to not help you out now. I'm going to help you. Out, but just remember, like I had a vision, you know, what I mean, you, like believe in the next person. Also, um, I find like when when you don't need the funding is when you can get the funding. And like, I feel like that's a major thing when it comes to like having a dream is like when when your dream comes to reality and, and, you, and you got excess of funds, like you don't, you know, what I mean, the, the banks will want to give you money or your friends will be like, hey, I believe in you now. But it's like. It's, it's, and it's not to, not to um not to feel away about your friends because sometimes it's on well it's, it's not sometimes it's always on us to sell our vision like it's on us to sell our dream to our friends to the world so that they can buy into it like they can't buy into or invest in something they don't believe in and if you can't convince them then it's on you it's, it's like it's on me it's on us so like I feel like um, selling our dreams selling our ideas um, are very important and that's the way to get funding that like and it's a simple way to like for me to get let's say a hundred thousand dollars from the bank i have to sell them that i'm financially sound my business plan is going to work and to sell it to my to, to sell just a single product to my friend i gotta let them know okay this is a sound product this product you're gonna like this you're gonna enjoy this product and then when they do buy the product and they're like damn like you said it, it did everything you said it was going to do and now i'm back for more and like you continue to do that and then it it, it, it ripples out and then you got a big business for sure, for sure. And I get you, brother. And I, I think like the biggest takeaway I got from that is just, you know, the the resources you have within your community. And I think that it, it ties right into your core beliefs of your brand, which is, you know, very strong character um, that you have to possess, you know, or people aren't going to really, you know, give you that. And to touch on what uh, Salisa and Barbara said is like your network, like building a network, like don't, don't just um, be narrow and like focus on like, the people you've been new or the you know what i mean you have to open up and meet new people and, and grow in order to get new ideas introduce new ideas to you because like even even in my own circle it's like one of my best like if, if i call my best friend and look for advice like nine times out of ten i i kind of i know what the advice is going to give you but if i call someone that maybe is in ty's network that that could give me um like business loan advice they're going to give me different advice that's going to give me a whole different perspective and and i find you have to go outside of your circle to get different ideas and to get like not saying like always but like like get out there and meet new people get new friends grow your network um collaborate work with other people don't just get stuck into what you're used to because that, that'll keep you like stagnant you got to continue to grow meet new people and expand well said trevor thank you for that thank you for that um so i'll move on to the next question and this is for my sister salita um so you have a very unique style in all aspects of the work that you do. Uh, what advice would you give someone that's searching for their identity? How do you manage to remain confident even in times of adversity and doubt? Well, but that ties back sort of to you know the coaching end of things, and I think when we first learn to accept us, that's where it begins because all of all of the variables that are going to get thrown at you, you know these adverse situations that you're going to get placed into if your foundation is built on accepting who you are then all these other things are just gonna you know slide off your back like water um so for me it's getting a firm foundation and there are going to be days that you're going to crash you're going to you know look in the mirror and not love what you see but if you started building that foundation of self-love and self-acceptance then all those things even though they come at you so that you have something to grab onto. There's a light that you can grab onto because then you know you stand in your truth. So I think my advice is just finding that space, finding people around you who are going to encourage you just the way you are, um, help you improve in the things that you need to improve in. Um, so you're you're creating a solid foundation of whether it's Ty or Salita or Barbara or Tyree, you know who you are and you stand in that truth. So when all these other external things keep coming at you um you can grab onto that and i'm not saying to be unrealistic because then you're gonna have moments when you don't like anything about yourself you don't like anything about your business because i'm there and as your business grows 
there are going to be a lot of challenges that you're going to want to give up. But if you're confident in the brand that you're building, um, I think you can always grab onto that, like that sense of purpose. So if it becomes more than just for a paycheck and like everybody else on the panel, we know that it's a struggle. And especially being, um, you know, black business owners that we're faced with other things like getting a loan. It, it's hard when you walk in, nobody wants to give you the money because they don't believe in your brand. They'll take what you're giving, but nobody wants to invest in that. So it's hard for us to build that equity. So we're doing it on our own. We're running to the friends, we're running to family, or we have to go paycheck to paycheck to make it. But if you believe in what you do and you have that sort of solid foundation of self, um, I think you use that as your sort of grounding force when everything else gets thrown at you. Um, and as a coach if, to my models and as the um, ASO where our students, what I would tell them is just find that solid thing that you love about yourself, you love about your brand, grab onto it so that when everything else comes rolling around you, you can grab that. So when a tornado is storming, you have something solid to, to grasp on and, and you know, help you to push forward. Because if it's a dream and you keep dreaming it, I believe it's worth dreaming. Therefore, keep chugging away at it um, and it, it, it will pay off eventually. Um, it's not going to be easy, but I believe it will pay off if it's really your passion and powerful. Great, great. I love that answer, Salita. And I think it's very important that you got to surround yourself around people that, you know, are going to uplift you and going to support who you are. You know, a lot of people sometimes I feel they, you know, they they almost see themselves in you and they might not want to attain or get something, you know, but they want to hold you back from doing it. So I think it's very important that your circle of people have to be really be, you know, uh, influenced to you in a positive way that's going to let you succeed. So thank you for that answer. So I really appreciate that. So this is the last question, formal question that I have, and then we're going to open up the floor to all the lovely questions that we've been getting. Uh, during this presentation. So my last question is for uh, my sister Barbara. Um, speaking to NSCC, NSCC resources that are available to entrepreneurs, as well as potential outside organizations, um, such as the Delmore Bunny Day Learning Institute, BEA, BBI, to name a few, what resources did you look at when starting out your business? I think my journey is a bit different than others. My education allowed me to kind of step into the journey and then um, having a full time job and working it really, I used those resources to start my businesses. Um, I started off by doing the counseling business and really not paying myself and kind of just working with what I had um, and using the money I could to pay for the insurance and the software that you need um, to do that type of business. And then from there, when my counseling business started to ramp up, I was able to use that money to put into my Afronova business because I think especially for businesses that you're looking at capital as clothing or products, you really do need a big chunk to start. It is because, you know, you might have four or five t-shirts or for me, jewelry and things, but then what if you sell out, but you don't make enough to buy more? <laughs> or what if you get an order that you can't fulfill because you can't afford to fill the order? So there is uh, a path for that. Um, so, but I was really lucky the way I decided to go about it and I was able to use some of my own money to invest in myself. But that doesn't mean that other people didn't invest their time, energy to help me. And my family was understanding about what I wanted to do because um, it's not just my money, it's my family's. Um, but when I talk about being blessed to see students fly, I realized that some of those flight wings they received from NSCC um, not only from all of our staff that most, a lot of our staff actually own their own businesses. So one of the reasons I wanted to do a private practice because a lot of people that I work with have their own. So I could see it in the staff. And then what I realized, a lot of people taking our courses, they knew they could become entrepreneurs after. They knew if they took the business course, um, they could be a bookkeeper. They could be on their own um, early childhood center. They could be their own personal caregiver. They could own so many different business, be their own plumber, welder. Um, and I really feel like NSCC has stepped up in entrepreneurship, has given our students the ability to start while they're in school 
even if it's not the exact path, like we said, take two to three hours. You can continue on both at the same time. Remember, you don't have to give up one to start the other. It's depending on where you are. So entrepreneurship has resources, free access to entrepreneurial resources like workshops, presentation, templates, toolkits for running your business plan. That is a big thing and one I still haven't mastered is a good business plan. And like um, Trev said, you really need to be able to sell your product. It's really only you, up to you. So a business plan really helps you do that because everyone needs to hear it a little bit different from the financial side, the style side, how it's going to sell the market. So having a good business plan really helps. And NCC can really help students do that. So even if you're in CCA, but you want to do clothing line, it doesn't mean you can't go out there. You know, even if you're in welding, but you're interested in cooking, go out there, check it out. Um, so financial support, we actually have access to a COA and different financial supports that can help you with expenses. A business advising, so you can have one on one business counseling for students and staff and faculty that are interested. We have guidelines. They know what they're talking about at NSCC. We have college wide activities like this one and so many more that are coming through. The other thing is that community connection. I saw students learn to connect with business, write business plans, and even some of them have their own space and their own offices already opened up while they're still in school. So I know firsthand that NSCC helped me with my business and I know that they can help our students. Um, I think uh, Tyree, you really said most of the other community resources, the BBI, which is the Black Business Initiative. Acronyms are such a big thing <laughs> that I realize that we're spouting off a lot. So know that you can always reach out to any of us, your advisor or entrepreneurship to get more information because um, there's so much out there. Um, so it's finding the right connection. And like we said, that network that can make that next answer the right question. Thanks. Thank you so much, Barbara. I love that. And I, you know, I'm just going to echo what you said with respect to anybody that just has any kind of questions like please reach out to any one of us, you know, regardless, you know, if it, you might think it's not, you know, a question that, you know, makes sense, just reach out to us. You know, the first step is always the hardest step and that's asking for help and, and reaching out. So like Barbara says, we have lots of resources here at NSCC to help you strive to be the very best that you can be, you know, because I feel like everybody has something that they can offer. And you know the goal of life is to find out what you can do for others. So that completes our formal session of questions. I'm going to now um, start to ask some questions to each entrepreneur. Um, we do have a lot of questions that did come in, so I'm going to stick to just maybe um, selecting just one entrepreneur at a time to some of these questions that are coming in just for time's sake, just so we can answer all the questions. Um, so the first question that I had that came in um, from Anonymous uh, and uh, who should I pick? I'll pick you, Trev. We'll just go in the same sequence that we've been we going and just keep it uh, simple. So the first question I have for you is, is it hard to get insurance for a company? Does it cover everything in terms of a loss? Is insurance very costly? Um, so I would say insurance is a necessary expense in, in case in case of, but um, it's not necessarily expensive. It's just when you have no money, it's hard to pay for insurance because you're like, do I pay for insurance? And I already have no money. You know what I mean? So it's kind of like you need the insurance in case something happens. But then it's like, like I, I would recommend 100% that like get insurance, but figure out how you you're gonna pay. But it's insurance should be in, almost as 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 important as your product or as your business or as paying your rent because it is very important because 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 uh. SHIT happens. So uh, I would say uh, it's not really hard. You just call around, you know, get quotes, uh, see who friends and family businesses have uh, insurance with and just kind of go from there. It's, it's, it's pretty straightforward, just like getting car insurance. But um, it, and there's different levels of insurance. So you can get insurance that covers everything. You can get insurance that covers stuff that's not on your property or not in like you can get insurance for mobile. You can get insurance for um, what do you call it? Uh, uh, shoot, what's it called? Uh, for events. So, like, say you have an event and, like, I don't know, something happens at the event or someone injures yourself, like, you get you can get insurance for that. So, you, it all all different types of bundles, and you kind of got to talk to an insurance specialist to get those that information. But it's pretty simple and easy to get. And once you got it, you're, you're, you're safeguarded. 
Awesome. Thank you for that. Barb, did you want to add anything into that? I just wanted to say that depending on the business, it's like you need insurance to start. So for my private practice, it's not like I could practice and not have it. I have to to practice. So it's the same thing with like cooking or things like that. Like depending on the business, you may need the insurance even before you can start it or at least go public. So it's also to know what type of insurance is good for the type of business you're at. The type of insurance I have would be different than the type of insurance the other presenters have. So I think that that's the thing about getting mentors and learning what they have and understanding the guidelines of who, where you're under. So let's say if it's food, like what does the food and industry say? You know, so I think that's a really important part that insurance is really depends on the product and the type of services you're offering. Very valid point, very valid point, Barb. Thank you for adding that on. Um, so the next question, I'm going to direct it to you, Salita. Um, this is also from someone that's anonymous. Um, do you have to return the full amount of the loan? Um, heard if the business is successful, you may not have to put the money back in, uh, the full amount. Is that true? And could you speak on that just a little bit? Yeah, well, I think that would sort of relate to the terms in the loan that you're getting uh, for certain grants. and as a new business owner or you know getting out there as an entrepreneur i think it's great for you to look at um grants and look at other things that you don't have to repay back so heading into a loan right off the bat um might put you a little put more stress on you as you're trying to now have to move inventory or depending on your service get clients in uh and depending on the terms you'd have to pay back uh, also my advice would be instead of you know going towards a loan direction, look for grants. The government have a lot of um, resources out there, and like what you have at NSCC as well. Go to the resources because I find that people on campus, um, our students, we don't go for the things that are there. The, re the resources are available, but we don't find out about it until we graduate. And it's like, whoa, that was available to me. Um, so do your research. Um, reach out to the people that are there to help you um, and go towards the direction of grants rather than loans as well depending on your product maybe you can have pre-orders so that the money they're bringing in is paying for the inventory right away so you're not stacking up um, payables to other people and you're not increasing your expense or liabilities so i would say structure it based on your business but avoid as much of the loan direction until you have sort of a solid financial secure pile to go that way and your business has already developed so you know your clients you know your customers you know the inventory is going to move so the possibility of paying off and repaying is going to be higher yeah. very valid response thank you so much Shalita. Uh, so the next question i'm going to direct it to barbara um, it's from Anonymous. Uh, the question is, do you have to serve, serve all people, even if they are rude or racist? Good question. Wow. I think we could have a panel discussion on that. Um, you know, I think that's an individual choice. I think the first thing in anything is you need to be safe. So if you don't feel safe doing that, then I think if you have a safe way to excuse yourself from the situation, but if you're able to educate someone and serve them at the same time, I think that's the best plate I'd love to serve. Because um, I would rather go high in all situations. But sometimes you can't always do it safely. So remember that. Um, and know that if you believe in your product or your employees or the people you're working with, that you're always wanting to serve it because that's what they're going to come away with. Well, I was served a good product. I had a good lunch. Well, she did a good job. They can't snag that away um for me i think that's in the forefront where i talk about my products and where they come from um like i have a big steel black lives matter sign in most of my events i have the stickers i have the stuff so if people are going to come at me they're ready for it but they're ready for the conversation and i talk about it so i think it's being educating yourself and knowing the responses to certain situations and that'll really help you feel more comfortable in those instances. So again, it's all about your safety though first. And reaching out to the community to help you. 
I really like that barber. You know, it's, it's, it's always nice to kill them with kindness is, is what my grandmother always taught me. Kill them with kindness. Um, so I'll move on to the next question. I will I will direct to Trev. Um, this question is from David Eisner. He asked, as a black entrepreneur, what challenges have you had when trying to access loans or funding for your business? Um, kind of feel like I already answered that a lot, but it's just the same thing. It's just like when you when you need it, you can't get it. And when you don't need it, you got it. But it's like um, that I would say that those are the challenges, but there's so much available. Like, say, for example, you, if you're not in like student loan debt or you're not in past debt from other businesses, it's it is so easy to get funding for a business. Like if, if you're not um, like especially for for um, for like uh, for anyone like anyone in Nova Scotia, I feel like like from my my, my uh, people from the black community or or white community is uh, it's pretty easy to get it. It's just coming from certain circumstances is 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 harder. So you know what I mean. So I find that's that's the barrier. Uh, I wish there was more like maybe grants opportunities available for um, some people and, and and less hoops that you got to jump through. Like I find that's that's like. Some of the things is like so many hoops that you got to jump through. So it's like, for example, like if you had one failed business, like there's no way you're getting funding if, if, if you're trying to start another business. So it's like, you know, what I mean, you fail once is kind of like a criminal record. Um, but, you know, it's, you know, just keep thriving, keep grinding. Sometimes you got to got to um, work and save up and make it happen later. Like you got to have the dream in your back pocket and be be prepared for it. Love it, love it, Trev. Um, this question is directed for uh, Salitha specifically, um, and I know you might have answered something very similar to this, but if you want to just, you know, give a little bit more uh, attention to this one. Um, do you find that you've also felt um, dismissed as an entrepreneur, not just based on the color of your skin, but also as your gender too? What are some of the hurdles that you have faced, particularly in the sexism and racism within your own industry? Oh, yeah, I would love to, you know, expand a bit on that, especially when it comes to being black and woman in in my fields, whether it's in the nonprofit um, world or the fashion industry. Uh, they see the skin, they see the woman walking in the room, uh, and that then sets the pace as to how serious I'm taking when I start speaking about my businesses, uh, clients, again, dismiss me in a room. If I'm a woman, you're there to help. Um, how dare you or you have the audacity to walk into this space demanding respect as um, my equal. And it's, it's, it's discouraging as well, but I think knowing that I am talented and my business isn't just some, you know, fluffy, something that, that I, I thought up to, to put out into the world. It's something that's coming with substance. And from my fashion industry, people think that beauty is just so surface, but it spills out into all aspects of your life. And I normally use my um, sort of purpose for doing both of the businesses that I have right now to get over the hurdle. So you may see a black woman and you dismiss me because I, I shouldn't be here doing this. And you see me as sort of just the the person behind the scenes and not the person in front of um in front of the or in the boardroom. You see me as somebody out at the desk letting you in. Uh, and as a woman, we're often dismissed because then one, you're too emotional to, to make this work. You know, what if you have children? Are you going to have as much dedication to it? I think we can have it all if we want it all. And a lot of women and black women and women across the spectrum are proving, you know, those outdated notions wrong. Um, so I just say, you know, go at, go after what you want. Um, stand in your truth again. Uh, and if your business is something that you're passionate about, regardless of the color of your skin or your gender, how you identify, that should never be a reason for dismissing your sort of place in that space. Um, so I think overcoming it for me was just knowing that what I was offering was good and um, needed in the industry that I'm in, whether it's in the world of 
philanthropy or fashion. Well said, Salita. Thank you so much for answering that. Uh, the next question comes from Megan, and, she, and this one's directed to Barbara. And I'll, honestly, Barbara, if you want to just speak a little bit on BBI during this question, that would be that would be cool. Um, so how did you learn about registering your business and the background information needed? That's what scares me about registering expenses and taxes. So if you just want to speak on a little bit like the hidden, you know, costs that maybe people might not know about. Um, yeah. Um, so just to go back with the BBI, I think if you're finding it hard to get a loan or get together the portfolio, basically, it's kind of like applying for a uh, job. You need a resume, you need a cover letter, you need to sell yourself or your business. Um, so I think that if you're looking for that um, and you're, you're public facing, so you're not an SEC student, really connect with the BBI. That is what they're made for, Black Business Initiative. So if you're going to get the support you need, I hope and you should get them there. Um, the other thing is if you're at another post-secondary and you're tuning in, they should have similar services as well. Um, so connect that and even just connect with entrepreneurship. You know, we always work with prospective students. So I'd say if you're having a hard time getting into that or understanding where to go first, check with the BBI or, you know, contact entrepreneurship. Um, so I was, I didn't know anything about registering for any of my business. I didn't really understand the process. So I reached out to mentorship to people that had businesses and asked them. So for my private practice, I spoke to a gentleman named Robert Wright. He's a social worker with one as well. And then I learned more about the insurances. And then a good Google search will probably give you a few things to read and then you go from there. So the great thing about it is you can learn all about them before you have to pay for them. So a lot of places will give you quotes. So that's what I've done. I learned the quote thing and um, I went from there and then I said, OK, these are the, these are all my quotes. This is what I can afford now. And then I went from there. So I think the first part is just open up and ask. Um, Google call up insurance companies that, you know, give insurance to whatever business you are at and then go from there. But um, most insurances are not as expensive as you think. And even registering a business name is about, and someone can correct me, between about $65 and I think $85 a year just for your business name alone. And that doesn't mean you have to do a business name. It's just more for like if this is going to be a long-term thing, you don't want someone else registering your business name and you know, you can no longer use it. So for me, Afronova really means a lot to me. And I wanted to make sure that it was registered because I felt like it was something unique. And I wanted, I wanted to have that um, as a legacy. So Access Nova Scotia as well is a good place and contacting the VBI or other places to support that. Very well said. Thank you, Barbara, for that. Uh, my next question, I want to direct it to Trevor. Uh, it's from Anonymous and it says, I want to start a communication company with a T-shirt printing company. Any advice on what kind of machine I need here and where to buy quality materials? Um, thank you for the question. So for me, um, I don't print my own stuff, um, but there's a place in Burnside that does it. And I, I find like the learning curve to, and the space you need to have like a printing press or like to have the, the printing materials, it takes up a lot of space. Um, so when it comes to like creating a communications company, I'll say, I'll say do, I would say do both simultaneously and have like the t-shirts, the like maybe get a small run of the shirts see if you could sell them, see if you can make profit off it first before like you buy all the equipment. Like I know uh, Atlantic, <clears throat> Atlantic screen printing in Dartmouth, their minimums are like 24 shirts or something. So I would even recommend you do something like that. And then you got 24 shirts just to see how it goes. And then from there, if if you see if you see a fit to like get them um, the equipment and all that stuff, then, then go ahead. And um, yeah, I think that, that would be like my best recommendation is to just not jump in like fully fledged, like do your business the service that you provide to get the funding and, and whatnot, and then use like some of the funding to um, fund the t-shirt business and then see what you could do with that al along the way. Because like honestly, if, if, if you want to do clothing, you got to go all the way in and you got to you got to put it all in. It's, it's, it's no joke. But if you can have if you can tie it in with a, a service based business or another business, 
where the where you can actually have like cash flow and like because I find like cash flow is like the blood of a business. It's what it's what allows you to grow. It's like it's what levels you up and allows you to unlock new things in order to like afford new things. So I find like if you get that down, then it's like there's there's you can experiment and do all the other stuff that you want to do or need to do when it comes to growing the business. Well said, Trev. Well said. Good, uh, good, good advice. Um, this question is for Salita. Um, it's from Paula. All three of you have your business that involves creativity and seeing um, and bringing beauty to people through your products and services. Where do you get your inspiration from? How do you keep your creative juices flowing and stay motivated, especially when you hit a wall or a downturn? Do you ever feel like giving up and what keeps you going? Well, I think my inspiration comes from just my love of fashion. I've always loved um, sort of manipulating the things that either my, my mom or my sisters would buy for me uh, and making it my own. I always wanted to look different than my cousins or my friends when we were you know, going out or anything. So I would do something different with the outfit. Um, and that sort of just sparked that whole love and the journey for me in the fashion industry. Um, surrounding myself with other creatives because I feel I can, I pull from their energy uh, and I can get in a room and we throw an idea out. So whether we were planning to do a brainstorming session, but an idea would get thrown out and I can, I can visualize and see something transforming into whether it's a production or a piece that we can put on the runway or on a model. Uh, so I think just, just surrounding yourself with like-minded people keeps that creative energy going and the block is it's hard to get over um, when it happens because it happens to us in all aspects of business regardless of the industry you're in but it's finding something that um, you grab onto so that sweet spot that safe space that you can go to as well uh, so I would encourage you know people who are whether you're creative or, or any other area so just find that something that you know you can go to, whether you're going through that period where there's a block, you want nothing to do with your creative or your business, uh, that you can always pull back, that can pull you back. So surrounding yourself with people that are like-minded and also having that source of sort of safe space that you can go into um, to get your, your juices running again. But fashion has always sort of been a part of me. I say it's in my blood now and yeah, I, I hope I pass that love for it on to the people that I come in, in contact with. And that's what keeps me going. Like, who's going to be the next generation of, uh, you know, people within our industry to take over? And am I going to be involved in helping them get there? That's my driving. Uh, that, that's what drives me, clearing the path for them. That answers the question, Paula. Beautifully said. You really said. I really appreciate that. Um, this question is directed for uh, Barbara. Um, this is from Anonymous. Um, is it practical to start a business from saved up personal money? I think I can say that probably everyone in the pan has probably used some of their personal money at one point to start their business. So um, I think it's going slow and steady. So if it depends on, like for me, um, I use the money from another business that I didn't need to put as much into. I didn't pay myself. So I and I worked a lot at it. So I would say that um, it's all about starting and really slowly with your business. So maybe it is, for me, it was only um, 10 masks, 10 Kente cloth face masks. That's how it started, just 10 masks. So it was my money. But then I noticed once I sold those and I made sure I made a profit. That's the thing, it's pricing your product to make sure that you not only pay for a new product, you pay yourself and you pay for your expenses. So if you price your products right and you start off with a small sample side, a small investment in yourself is probably the most big investment you can give yourself. So I started with a small sample size. I priced it properly, which made it made I pay, mean I pay back myself. I gave myself enough money to buy my product again and a little bit of money extra to buy something else. So if you start off small, if you see the idea for your business growing, you should start to see that slow incline, right? It's not going to be a jump, but it will move up. From there, that's when you can start looking for grants and different things out there, because they are out there. Um, COVID is really, the government is really uh, investing 
in the community and businesses. So I'd say uh, there's something out there for everyone. So I think if you're going to invest in anyone, invest in yourself. Just make sure your budget and your plan is sound. Invest in yourself. I love it, Barbara. And uh, I was actually going to bring that up too, because you know, post COVID, there's going to be a lot of great resources out there to support small and medium-sized businesses, especially in marginalized uh, communities. So uh, there's no better time than now to to really sit down and decide what it is that you want to do, and and you know, provide that. Um, my next question is for Trevor directly. It's from Anonymous. Um, how did you start your business? I know you kind of answered that, but how old were you when you started your business? Started about 26, I think, when I started. Um, so I did other various businesses before I started this one. Um, so I drove a taxi cab during my undergrad, and uh, I, I kind of like like to do unconventional things. So I drove taxi cab, then I started a limousine company from it. And like this is kind of like one of my like regrets in life is once I got to law school, I sold the limo business. And it's just like looking back, like because I thought law school was the end all to be all. Like I thought that's what I wanted, that's what's gonna get me where I need to go. And then once like the like probably was like a year after I sold the limo business, but I'm ended law school, I was just like, damn, like why did I do that? And like even now looking back, it's like, um, who knows what could have happened because you never know what could have happened, but I know that the potential was there and, and and if and if it was just something so easily to keep that I could have just said, okay, well let me keep the taxi, let me keep the limo, let me like, hire a driver, and it, it would have just been simple. Like the business kind of it, it, it doesn't require that much work to run like a taxi or a limousine business. So I could have still had it while in law school and I could still have it now while running Trap Clothing. So it's kind of one of those things that damn, like I wish I would have kept it. So it's like, um, what was the what was the question again? I want to fully, hopefully, like fully answer. I think you answered it perfectly, man. And, and I, you know, I I I was also a cab driver at one point too, so I, I know the hustle. I know that you got to do a lot of different things, you know, to make your dream come true. And, and so I really like that. And that's one um, of the one of the reasons why I did it was because it's kind of like provide money while I'm doing my undergrad. Plus, it it exposes me and makes me have to talk to people. And I feel like that's a skill that we need as like entrepreneurs or as business people working in the world. You need to be able to communicate and like, like there's there's certain times where like, um, what you guys were saying earlier about like uh, maybe tense interactions might happen, and you got to kind of be able to diffuse them. And I feel like the like the way that you're able to diffuse them is because you've had different experiences and how you learn to uh, cope or how you learn to um address those situations and, and and minimize the risk and just like those like i learned a lot from driving cab and having to be like exposed to that type of environment i love it i love it thank you so much Trevor. um so just for time wise guys what i'm going to do is i'm going to i have maybe five um questions that i'm going to you know ask you guys to just maybe take 30 seconds to answer just for the sake of time, I, you know, I think that these are kind of funner questions for you guys as opposed to, you know, the more formal. Um, so I'll, I'll start, you know, I'll start the same way with you, Trev, and then go to Salitha and Barbara. So, you know, if you could just maybe spend a minute on each question and then we'll do the, the closing. Um, so who is someone that has inspired you along your journey? Do you have role models? Uh, so for me, I would say um, I got like a few role models and most of them are like are black. And so I would say like uh, Muhammad Ali, Johnny Cochran, um, Jay-Z. So like Jay-Z, I remember when I was in grade five, I got these jeans that were Rockerwear. I didn't even know what Rockerwear was. I didn't even listen to Jay-Z back then. But my mom's like, these are Jay-Z, Jay-Z's brand or whatever. So like when I went to school, like I felt like I was the coolest kid at school. And like, I feel like that was when like, fashion kind of like grade five is when like video games and like playing kind of left and like I was all about like fashion and being cool and like stuff like that so it's kind of it kind of grew on me from then and then like even even back like when I was younger those days like my friends used to call me Gucci Goods like that was like my nickname because I had all like I was always cool I guess I always had the fresh fresh goods fresh clothes so yeah that's uh like uh Jay-Z kind of like inspired that with the Rockaway brand and then forward to like fast forward to now when when uh like Virgil Abloh and a lot of a lot of um black entrepreneurs, black fashion people, they um 
they continue to inspire today. But like financial freedom is one thing that I get from a lot of like the inspiration, inspirational black entrepreneurs that I follow and it's, it's attainable. I love it. I love it. I had some Rockaway gear too, man. So I appreciate I appreciate you shouting them out. Uh, Salita, how about you? Well, for um, mentor inspiration, um, once I got into the fashion industry, Naomi Campbell, she was the reason I thought I launched in because it was seeing this beautiful black woman on TV and then not knowing anything about this part of sort of career. Um, I just love, loved it. I love what fashion did for me and it saved me when I was going through a lot of rough paths. Like that was my saving grace and that's why I go so hard with the talent that you know, we represent as well as you know my coaching. I want to give them something that fashion gave me, sort of that hope. Um, and in terms of people I look up to would be my sister. Um, she's such a giving soul and so pure. Uh, and for her, nothing, nothing is m too much to, to help somebody. She would go out of her way. And that's why sort of we led to that path of creating the Atlantic Scholarship Organization. And my first agent, Brendel, she, she, she's my, my mentor going forward and, and, you know, pulling me into the industry and giving me the path because she's opened doors that were shut to me. And even when she opened and shoved me through them, people still resisted me because of the way I look. So yeah, Brendel, Naomi, and Michelle, um, those are my, those are the people I grab on to in terms of inspiration. I love it, I love it. Barbara, you're up. Um, when I was doing my master's in social worker, I had an amazing clinical supervisor named Neil Rock. And um, she's a, a black Jamaican uh, descent lady and I just, knew that she was amazing. I knew that what she was doing for others is something I would like to try to do. I never even thought I could do it, truthfully. I wasn't ready for the type of work she did, but listening, learning, and being open to new things allowed me to continue on my journey, meet another social worker from Nova Scotia, Robert Wright, and um, connecting these two amazing people together, I realized that there was room for me. And when I spoke to community, I was in a community, I realized there was need for me. Because sometimes you could feel like you want to, but you also feel needy. You, have to, you need to find that niche. And um, so that was kind of that way. And I think similar to uh, seeing people that look like you, it was I wanted to see products that look like me. I remember making my mom go to every store trying to find me a black Barbie doll or a black doll. And I'm older than some of you folks. So you see a lot more of them now. But even then you don't see very much. So I really wanted to bring products that I don't see every day. Um, and I also wanted to know where my products come from. I wanted to, my friend that buys products in Ghana, he goes around the markets. I see the markets, my head wraps from there. I see where it's made and it's coming right back to me. So I love that journey. And I love working with my community to co-create beautiful products. So that inspires me. I love it, Barbara. I love it. So I guess I got two more questions for you guys each. Um, if we could just kind of go quick with these questions just for time's sake. Um, in in lights of African Heritage Month, I wanted to ask you guys, wh who are your favorite notable Black Nova Scotians? You know, they could be living today. They could, could have passed by now. Um, and what did you learn from them? Trev, I'll start with you again, brother. So um, I'll say George Dixon just because um, like he's very notable he's like the first black boxing champion and uh he's like my family last name from North Preston is Dixon too and I'm pretty sure they have roots to George Dixon um just just being inspirational and like setting trends and being able to like be the first of and not to just to be the first just to say that I'm the first or that he's the first but just to be able to break those barriers and the, to make a change and do something different I feel like he he, he's an inspiration for that. And it's also um, just, uh, what did I say? Yeah, yeah, that uh, sums it up. That's great, I love it, I love I love that. Uh, Salita, you're up next. Who's your favorite notable Black Nova Scotian and why? Well, seeing that I'm the, I guess, the only immigrant in the, the room, um, for me, and it, for me, it's seeing these people, what they're, 
potentially what, where they're going with their journey. So it would be Trevor Silver and Tyree Haley. Um, Ty Haley. So um, just knowing that the future is going to be in hands like yours. And I know I'm not a born Nova Scotian, but I feel so much attachment and respect for this province and the people of Nova Scotia, as well as the black community. And just seeing what the two of you as young men, and it, it, it is not because of black or anything, but just young men, what you are trying to, to achieve and seeing you overcome your struggles and enjoying the success that you are having in the moment. I just can't wait to see where you take this. And I'll, I'm honored and proud to say I know both of you. Uh, so yeah, you're you're the, the heroes and, and the people that I am just excited to see where this journey takes you and where you come from. Oh my gosh, thank you so much, Alita, for saying that. You know, I think the world of you too, my sister. So thank you so much. Uh, Barbara. You're up. No, I don't think I can top it. Um, I love that because sometimes when we talk about African Heritage Month, we think we're talking 100 years. And it's important to understand your history, but it's also important to understand the journey and the present and where we've gotten to. So I learned about uh, Rose Fortune in school, and she was an amazing black lady that was like the first police officer in Annapolis. And she was a bigger black woman, which I identified with. She carried a gun and she made sure no one would steal anything from the ships. So it was, it was amazing uh, to learn about her and as a woman and just that piece and the image that came in my head. But then I realized that a lady named Dorle Doreen um, Lewis was her ancestor. And she was the principal of Acre League when I worked there. But I didn't know that at the time. Unfortunately, I only realized that after she passed. But she saw also was an amazing black woman. And I wish I would have known what I know you now to realize that I worked for an amazing woman like that. So I guess what I say is that um, the other piece is just that the Pan-African flag is an amazing thing because it doesn't matter where you're from, we're all under that flag. That flag was made for us. It was made for all the diaspora, you know, from Mother Africa and from all their children. So no matter what country you're from, if you're black, you're under that flag. So I've learned so mo much about that, that when I hear African Nova Scotian Canadian, you don't have to be born here to be one of us. You're part of one of us because our ancestors all came from the same place, you know? Um, so I just appreciate that. And that's the education that I want to get. And also that historical timelines don't go in a vacuum. We, like we are all treaty people. We all have a shared history. And there's so much beauty out there if we just take the time to breathe and open our ears. Wow, so beautifully said. I think on that note, I will, you know, close this presentation out. Um, you know, that completes our event. I want to thank all of you entrepreneurs uh, for coming on and sharing your stories and your experiences. On behalf of NSCC, our students, our faculty, our alumni and management team, we really, truly appreciate you. So thank you. I also want to thank everybody who came together to put this event together. Um, IT, marketing, communications, entrepreneurship, uh, other people as well. You know, whether you shared this event with your network or, you know, you're just tuning in to support, we truly thank you all. You know, we, we hope to continue to do things like this in the in the future and, and provide, you know, quality content to you guys so that you guys can pursue what, what it is that you're, you know, meant to do. So I really appreciate everybody uh, for tuning in. Uh, don't forget to fill out the survey link in the chat for a chance to win one of our three special surprise packages um, that's sponsored from each entrepreneur. The beauty of it is we're going to we're going to actually uh, allow whoever wins to, you know, meet with the entrepreneur and you guys can kind of discuss what product you want. So we're really trying to make it specialized for the individual because at, at the end of the day, that's what matters. Um, if you didn't get any of your questions answered, I apologize in the time frame, but you know, we, we, we will send out some information on entrepreneurs so you can re, you can connect with them and ask some questions um, if you'd like. So on behalf of NSCC, thank you all so much for attending this event. Please stay safe and have a wonderful weekend.